if we discovered there was an asteroid heading towards Earth, which there isn't, don't panic, but if we did, what would we do about it? I mean, personally, I'd rather not rely on Bruce Willis, Ben Affleck and Steve Buscemi setting off a nuclear bomb in close proximity to Earth. But if you guys have some sort of plan in place, you know, just in case. Now, thankfully, NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, do. Last week on Wednesday, the 24th of November, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART mission, was launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and sent on its way to an asteroid that is not a danger to Earth. Like, I feel like I have to keep saying this, but instead it's a test, right? Just to see if we could possibly change the course of an asteroid. Now, the spacecraft that was launched last week, the DART mission, it won't actually arrive at this asteroid until September 2022. But when it does, what it'll do is essentially crash straight into the asteroid, essentially acting a little bit like the white cue ball in a game of pool or snooker, right? It'll essentially give the asteroid a little bit of an energy boost, specifically kinetic energy or movement energy. And if you increase the kinetic energy of something, then its speed goes up. Now, we're doing this test to see how much we can actually change the asteroid speed by. We think from our calculations, it's going to be around about 0.4 millimeters a second, which is tiny, right? But over time, that increase in speed actually does change things. It means that if, God forbid, there ever was an asteroid on a collision course with Earth, then we'd end up with a near miss instead of a collision. Because you have to remember, both the Earth and an asteroid would be moving on their orbits around the sun. The Earth moves its entire diameter, which is around about 13,000 kilometers, in the space of about seven minutes. So that tiny change in the arrival timing of the asteroid from upping its speed is all you need to be able to avoid that doomsday collision. That's the basic idea anyway, but people had a lot of questions about this mission, so let me answer a few of them now, starting with what if in this test, we take an asteroid that is not a danger to Earth, that is currently off course, and we knock it on course. That's not a danger here. The asteroid that was chosen for this mission was specifically chosen because it's orbiting another much larger asteroid. It's what we call a binary asteroid system, which is actually quite common for asteroids in our solar system. We actually reckon that about a sixth of all near-Earth asteroids are actually in these binary systems. So the DART mission will be crashing into the smaller of the two, called Dimorphos, about 160 meters in diameter, which is orbiting around the larger asteroid, Didymus, of 780 meters in diameter. So when DART crashes into that smaller asteroid, Dimorphos, all it's going to do is speed it up in its orbit around the bigger one, right? There's not enough energy in that collision to do anything else, right? DART is only 500 kilograms in mass, whereas Dimorphos, the asteroid, is 4.8 billion kilograms in mass. It's equivalent to like a housefly hitting into a pickup truck, right? It's not strong enough to either break up the asteroid into lots of different fragments or knock the whole um, Didymus system off its orbit around the sun, putting it on a collision course with Earth. So it's not something we have to worry about. But it is just enough energy to give it that speed kick. What we want to test, though, is how much of the speed kick, how much energy was actually transferred so that if we were ever in this position in the future where there was an asteroid that was a danger to Earth, we know how much energy we can transfer to it and we can work out how much that would deflect it in its orbit. So that leads us to our next question, which is how will we know it actually works? Well, by crashing DART into Dimorphos at around about 6.6 kilometers a second, which is about 15,000 miles an hour, right? It's pretty hefty speed. It should speed it up and change its orbit by about 10 minutes. Like its orbit around like how long it takes to go around Didymus will get shorter by 10 minutes. Now we can track this using telescopes on the ground because we look to see how the brightness of the whole system changes as Dimorphos passes behind Didymus and then passes in front of Didymus as well. 
And that's the whole reason we can see asteroids in the first place, right? Because they reflect the sun's light just in the same way that the moon and all of the planets do as well. So when the smaller asteroid is hidden behind the bigger one, we don't get as much light. And when it's in front of the bigger one, it also blocks some of the bigger one's light and we still don't get as much light as when they're both visible side by side. So we get these two dips in brightness that happen periodically, right? And from that, we can work out how long an orbit takes. So we've got data on how long the orbit takes from before the impact. And then we'll get data after the impact and see if that gap between each dip in brightness gets shorter, right? That Dimorphos' orbit got shorter shorter because it's sped up because of this energy boost from dark. Now we should know within about a week after the spacecraft actually crashing into the asteroid in September 2022 when it finally gets there, we should know whether it's been successful or not. We'll have the data and we should be able to tell straight away. But the European Space Agency, ESA, is also sending the HERA spacecraft, which will launch in 2024 and arrive at the Didymus system in 2027. Around about five years after the sort of crash and impact of the dark mission just to see what the long lasting impact has been on the entire system and get really precision measurements that are not as easy from the ground. Now as simple as the physics is here right you know the kinetic energy afterwards is the kinetic energy of the asteroid before plus the kinetic energy of DART. There is still some uncertainty over how much energy or momentum will actually get transferred to the asteroid. And that's because this, this collision, this impact is going to be the same as any other impact we see across the solar system in that it will punch a crater into the surface of the asteroid. And in that process, will throw material out, something we call ejecta. That material that's thrown outwards will actually steal some of the energy in that collision, reducing the energy that's actually transferred to the asteroid. We just don't know how much of that material we're going to get because it depends sort of like what the asteroid is made out of as well. So again, we're going to need really precision measurements of what actually happens in the collision, which is why the Italian space agency is also sending a CubeSat, which is going to piggyback with DART, detach about 10 days before the impact, and then essentially take as many pictures as possible of the time leading up to the impact and afterwards to use in that analysis to work out how much ejector was there and does that actually coincide with the energy boost that we will hopefully see. But how likely is it that we're actually going to need this mission in the future? Are there actually any asteroids that are a threat to Earth? Now, none of the 8,000 known near-Earth asteroids are going to be a threat to the Earth in the next 100 years. Now, the key word in that sentence is known asteroids. There could be a whole host of other asteroids that we haven't found yet because they're just too difficult to find because they're so faint. Now, the biggest ones, the most dangerous ones that are like kilometers across, right? They reflect the most light from the sun. So they're brighter, they're easier to spot moving relative to the fixed stars in the background, even if they're quite far away. So pretty sure we've got a good handle on where all the biggest near-Earth asteroids are, and we know that they're not a danger to us. Of course, that's not to say that you couldn't then have an asteroid or a comet that's on a really long orbit around the sun that takes it way out to the far reaches of the solar system that, you know, could come back into the inner parts of the solar system and be a risk. But if that was the case and it was that large, we'd spot it a really far distant out and we would have enough warning to do something about it. The smaller ones though, which are only a few hundred meters across, like Dimorphos, reflect a lot less light. So they're really faint. And we don't spot them as easily. You start getting into the danger zone with asteroids around about 150 meters, which is what Dimorphos is. It's one of the reasons it was picked for this test as well. With those, they're so faint, you don't see them until they're a lot closer to Earth. So we might not get as much of an advanced warning, you know, six months, a year, if we're lucky. You know, we don't want to be scrambling around like headless chickens for a year, trying to design and plan and build and launch a whole new mission that's never been tested before. That's why the DART mission is so important, especially if it works, because then we have a plan, we know it works, we can literally unbox it, launch it, problem sorted. But if you're wondering, well, why are we bothered about the small asteroids anyway? Because surely they won't cause as much damage as like the kilometers across ones, right? Well, let me put it into a little bit of context for you. So the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago was thought to be 10 kilometers across, 10,000 meters, right? That kind of impact would affect the entire world. It would be a global extinction event is what we call it, right? You would have a false winter essentially because of all of the debris that would get launched into the atmosphere and block out the sun. And it would be a danger to every single person on earth. 
Asteroids that are about a kilometer across or a thousand meters, they would cause damage on a continental scale. Like obviously everyone around the world will probably be affected by it, but the damage would at least be concentrated to a specific continent. Or if it landed on the ocean, which is the most likely scenario because the Earth's surface is 70% water, then it would cause a tsunami that would be absolutely devastating to coastal regions. Then you've got the asteroids that are 150 meters across and up, like Dimorphos. And these asteroids would cause really local concentrated damage. So if they hit a populated area, I mean, the results would be absolutely devastating, right? Like completely unimaginable. You could have entire cities wiped out. If it landed close to a city, you could have an entire city displaced as well. We do not want this. And these are the things that we might not have as much advance warning on and why we need DART. Then we've got even smaller asteroids that we don't spot until they enter the Earth's atmosphere, right? Like the Chelyabinsk meteor that struck over Russia in 2013. That was estimated to be around about 20 meters across and caused a huge amount of devastation there. When it was burning up in the atmosphere, it was actually for a moment brighter than the sun. Just to give you an idea of what that would be like to see falling through the sky. So the risk of asteroids has to be taken seriously. Those 8,000 known near-Earth asteroids are estimated to be only around about 40% of the true number that's out there. This is why we need a plan. And to be honest, I think I'm going to sleep a little bit better at night knowing that the DART mission has now launched and we're actually going to test out this plan. If DART doesn't work though, and it, and it doesn't give as much energy to this asteroid as we'd hoped and change the speed as much as we'd hope, then what are our other options, right? I mean, there's lots of different ones available. There's just a huge big trade-off for all of them between performance and cost and risk and whether the technology even exists to do it. But essentially it all boils down to like two different options. Either you deflect the asteroid, like in DART's case, or you break up the asteroid somehow. And breaking up the asteroid, usually people tend to leap towards like the idea of a nuclear bomb. And actually you can use a nuclear bomb to do both breaking up and deflection as well. A nuclear bomb detonated just above the surface of an asteroid would give it enough of a kick to deflect it slightly in its orbit so that you'd end up with a near miss. You don't actually need Bruce Willis to drill down in Armageddon. And the astronauts in Deep Impact didn't have to sacrifice themselves flying down into the center of the asteroid either with their nuclear bomb. The age-old problem with a nuclear device though is obviously nuclear waste, radioactive waste from the nuclear bomb. That can become a huge issue, you know, if you, especially if it's detonated close to Earth, you know, you could save yourselves then, but in the future cause yourself a massive problem because every time Earth comes back to that point in its orbit, it's like, oh yeah, March is, is radioactive month again, and, and you cause a whole host of other problems that you then have to solve. So deflection is often considered the best option, but then the question is, what do you use to deflect, right? You basically need anything that can somehow transfer energy from one thing to the asteroid, whether that's radiation pressure from sunlight itself by building essentially a huge magnifying glass in space, or similarly radiation pressure from firing a really powerful laser at it, or even somehow attaching a rocket engine to the surface of an asteroid and then burning a load of rocket fuel so that you essentially push the asteroid off course that way, or better yet with technology that actually exists crashing a spacecraft into the surface. It's definitely the cheapest option because the technology exists, but also because it's incredibly simple as well. It's a win-win situation, really, as long as it works. So you know that I'm going to be keeping an incredibly close eye on the DART mission when it arrives at the Didymus system in September 2022 and all of the results and everything that happen after the impact. And I'll be keeping all of my fingers and toes crossed in hope that this very beautiful simple physics solution to this problem actually works. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app with a huge range of interactive courses on science, maths, and computer science. Personally, I learn best by working through a problem myself, and Brilliant allows you to do just that, getting a really good grip on a specific concept or topic through the little interactive widgets that they have on all of their courses, plus 
It's just really fun as well. You know, perhaps you want to brush up on some basic physics concepts like what kinetic energy is or conservation of energy to understand the DART mission better. Brilliant has a great science essentials course that'll let you do just that. Or maybe you want to understand how we calculate the different orbits of objects in the solar system with Brilliant's gravitational physics course. So check them out if you're interested or maybe as a gift for, you know, someone else in your life that is curious and loves to learn. Head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and you can sign up completely for free. That link is also in the video description down below and the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription, either for yourself or to gift to someone else. So thank you so much as always to Brilliant for continuing to support this channel. And now, roll those bloopers. All it will do is increase its speed as it goes round the larger asteroid. Ah, like, man. Oh, I wish Greek was like Latin and there was like no agreed way of pronouncing the words so you could get away with anything with Latin. Greek, less, less so. D dimorphous, dimorphous. I <laughs> heard the BBC say dimorphous, so I'm going to stick with that. Involved as well. But essentially, the oil oil they all go boil down <laughs> you when i dream of you sweetest dream i'll never do i still miss you there and i don't want to miss a thing you don't think it's a bit weird that armageddon's like theme tune was like don't want to miss a thing like yeah you do you want that asteroid to miss the earth <laughs>